Good morning, everyone. We have just two or three minutes left. Uh, we've got quite a few people on board, but we're just going to give it a couple of minutes to let other people log on and we'll get started. All right, we got about a minute left till we get started. We still got some more people logging on. Uh, just going to give everyone a heads up. We'll be starting in just about a minute. If anybody wants to get settled, grab your coffee, get ready. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for taking the time to, to join us today. Uh, we're doing the Preventing Slips, Trips, and Falls uh, floor care webinar. Uh, today, we just have a few housekeeping things to start with. Um, you have a, an opportunity to submit questions throughout the, the webinar. Uh, we'll have a Q&A period at the end of the webinar. But if you go to the control panel under the, the chat tab, you could submit a question, and then uh, at the end of the, the session, we'll take a look at all the questions, see what we can answer for you. Um, after the webinar today, uh, the presentation is going to be recorded. Uh, it'll be on societyinsurance.com under risk management, education, and training. And you can also find it at Society Insurance's YouTube channel anytime. So you'll be able to use it uh, to show coworkers, employees, whatever, anytime you want. You can always find it on the YouTube channel or on our webpage. So before we begin, uh, we want to do just a quick overview of what Society Insurance is, if you're not familiar with the company. Uh, we're a regional insurance carrier that's based in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. Uh, we currently write business in six states, all Midwest states, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Minnesota, and Tennessee. Uh, we've been writing workers' compensation insurance since the company started in 1915, but we also offer property, liability, commercial auto coverage, and we have extensive knowledge and experience in protecting restaurants and bars, supermarkets, convenience stores, hotels, motels, medical clinics, and artists and contractors. We really have a focus in our niche, which is the hospitality industry. A little bit about us. Uh, my name is Shelby Blundell. I'm a risk control representative. I handle the northern part of Illinois for Society Insurance. Came on board with Society in 2010. Uh, I have a master's degree in biosecurity and disaster preparedness, and I have a background in safety, risk management, and emergency management. And I'm joined today by Frank Norton. Hello, I'm Frank Norton. I'll be your second presenter today. I'm a senior risk control consultant, and my job is to work with society's 
policyholders to reduce hazards that could develop into claims. Most of my time is spent working with policyholders to reduce hazards that cause these slips and fall claims and set up safety programs to prevent them. My work territory with society encompasses the great states of Illinois, Indiana, and Iowa. I have worked in risk control for over 30 years. I have earned the following professional designations, Associate in Loss Control Management, or it's referred to as an ALCM, Certified Safety Professional, referred to as a CSP, Certified Fire Protection Specialist, referred to as a CFPS, Charter Property and Casualty Underwriter, referred to as a CPCU, and Walkway Auditor Certificate Holder, or WAC, W-A-C-H. All right, thanks, Frank. So let's get started. Slip and falls are uh, due to improper floor care are the leading cause of injuries in workers and customers. That's our number one claim area for society insurance. This webinar is designed to help your business recognize and implement proper floor care procedures to prevent these types of incidents from ever occurring. This, in this includes insight into methods and systems for proper care of your floor surfaces and the different types of flooring. By, you know, there's several things we want to get to by the end of, of this webinar. We want you to walk away from here with several key points. We want you to know the significant impact of slip and falls on a business's bottom line. Those are your dollars. That's what's really important, that each day you protect the money that you're making. Important steps to make existing floor surfaces less slippery. That way it'll prevent those slips and falls. We want to know how to select and use proper floor care equipment and cleaning chemicals so that we're not wasting our time and we're doing it the right way. And we also want to know how to implement proper floor care procedures at your business. That way you're doing it the right way all the, all, all the time. Throughout the webinar, we're going to have several poll questions. These are just easy little questions, kind of get you engaged, see where you're at on things. Um, so we're going to kick it off with the first one. Um, do you think you know what percentage of society insurance claims are related to slip and falls? Now, these include both general liability and workers' compensation claims. So we're thinking about frequency here. So we're going to ask what the frequency is of slip and fall claims for both general liability and workers' compensation. And this is related to society insurance. So if you'll select your answer, you've got three choices, 24, 34, 44%. Looks like we got about 77% of people in voted. We've got a few more people to go. Appreciate you taking the time to answer the question. It kind of gives us a chance to see, see where you're at and what, what you believe going into this. All right, we got 100% of the vote in. Awesome, thank you. Let's take a look and see. Looks like we got 62% are saying 44%, 38% of you said 34%, and the actual answer is 44%. So. Unbelievably, 44% of our slip and fall of our claims come from slip and falls. Okay, we've got another poll question for you. We're going to go ahead and making this difficult. Two questions in a row. What is the average cost to society insurance for a slip and fall claim? Now, this is going to be again general liability and workers' comp. So. What do you believe that the, the average cost is for a slip and fall claim? Give you just a minute, we've got 62% voted and the numbers are coming in. Who wants to be a millionaire? I think we got one more. And it looks like the looks like every, almost everybody's in. We'll go ahead and keep it moving. Uh, $7,400 is the average cost of society insurance for slip and fall claims. Frank, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yes, I, I want to uh, present to the audience that this is kind of a low number. I did research uh, using the internet and other companies publish what their results are, what their claims costs are. And it wasn't uncommon for me to find the average cost of a general liability slip and fall to be around $13,000 and the average cost of a worker's compensation injury resulting from a slip and fall to be about $18,000. I want to point out that uh, you know we're a niche market, 
we specialize uh, in uh, the restaurant industry, the grocery store industry, the hotel. I mean, the slips and falls are major types of claims for this type of indus industry. Our claims department is specialized in handling slips and falls. So I believe that impacts the result, why it's lower than other companies. Also, we spend a lot of time analyzing the causes of slips and falls. We send out our risk control representatives to work with our insurers to reduce them. So all this, all this combined effort that society does for our policyholders is one of the reasons this number is so low. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, we're one of the one of the rare companies that has so many walkway auditors, and and our risk control department really spends a lot of time in the field, really trying to keep a control on it. All right, the number of slips and falls cost um, each business, and it really impacts the bottom line. Uh, it impacts your premium. So whenever you have slip and falls, each each occurrence affects your rating. Uh, it's called the work comp mod. It affects the rating as that goes down, your premiums can go down. Uh, and unfortunately, as that goes up, it can also increase your premium. So it, it really does impact the bottom line uh, for your workers comp, but it also impacts the business's general liability premiums. Uh, they're really influenced by the total cost of the number of, of, of the claims each year. Uh, the cost of your general liability slip and fall claims impact your insurance premiums each year on renewal. And by reducing the number of slip and fall claims, uh, each time they occur, if you can eliminate one, that, that could help lower your premium year after year. So let's talk about the business reputation also. A lot of people don't take that into consideration when they're talking about the effects of a slip and fall. You know, bad news travels really fast and, and it doesn't take much to get the, the local news to come out and cover a, a negative story when an elderly woman or somebody famous or anybody at all has a nasty fall or an injury on your property, uh, usually the news channels are very quick and easy to come out and cover it. And, and that, negative, that negative news will impact your bottom line uh, just by the, the reputation that it hurts. Uh, your customers may also, if you know, one of them falls, they may need uh, costly medical treatment. They, they may not be able to work while they're recovering. And then unfortunately, as they sit at home and listen to the commercials that are midday, they may hear attorneys telling them that they need to come seek their help and that they need a big check. And it, sometimes, it, sometimes it's legitimate and sometimes it just really costs a lot. I'm gonna speak now about commercial floor cleaning chemicals. There are two types, the enzyme-based formula chemicals and the, cre the cleaner degreaser formula chemicals. Enzyme-based formula floor cleaning chemicals. Enzyme-based floor cleaners are cleaning products that use non-pathogen good bacteria to digest greases and oils from floors and grout. The bacteria do this by producing enzymes specifically designed to break down certain molecules, greases and oils, into smaller pieces. Some people call these enzymes bugs. Ew, yuck. Yeah, I know. That eat the grease on the floor, but they are not bugs at all. The enzymes keep feeding until everything is eradicated. And once there is no longer anything left for the enzymes to feed on, they disintegrate. Ecolab's Wash and Walk is an example of an enzyme-based cleaner. Proper use of enzyme-based floor cleaning chemicals. Mix with cold or lukewarm. Hot water kills the enzymes. Do a slop mop, a wet mop, instead of a damp mop. Leave cleaning chemical on the floor until the solution penetrates the dirt on the floor. Leave it on for no less than five minutes. Brush floor with stiff bristled brush. Mop up solution or squeegee towards floor drain. Do not rinse. The enzymes must be left on the floor to work. Allow to air dry. Some insureds use fans 
to speed up the drying process. Common improper uses of enzyme-based floor cleaning chemicals. There are seven, several common ways that enzyme-based floor cleaning chemicals are improperly used, which kills the enzymes and, a, and the effectiveness of this cleaner. Using hot water to mix the chemicals kills the enzymes. They're living organisms. You kill them with hot water. If a mop head used with other cleaning chemicals like degreasers or standard floor cleaners is used to apply the enzyme-based floor cleaner, the other chemicals left in the mop head kill the enzymes. If enzyme-based floor cleaners are applied to the floor near cooking and food prep equipment, the enzymes will be killed from overspray of sanitizing chemicals used to clean the kitchen equipment. Again, these are living organisms. The sanitizing chemicals kill them. When enzymes are dead, you have basically mopped the floor with dirty water. This could be the reason why your floors may appear like they have not been cleaned and are constantly slippery. That's something that's tough because we've always grown up thinking you've got to wash your hands with warm soapy water. So it's always got to be warm water. So employees come in and they think, it's got to be warm soapy water if you're going to clean. And then with these enzymes, you've really got to have the cold water. So that's something that management's really got to hammer into them to get them to think, this is cold water. This is different than your regular warm soapy water. Yeah, that's, that's a good point, Shelby. Now, we're going to talk about how to prevent the misuse of enzyme-based floor cleaning chemicals. And, it, and Shelby just mentioned the, one of the most important ways. But I'm going to outline a few more. So here's how to properly use enzyme-based floor cleaning chemicals. Make sure your staff only mixes the chemical with cold or luke water, lukewarm water. That's the type of water that you can put your hand in and it's uh, under and it's warm. Designate a mop and mop bucket specifically for use with the enzyme-based cleaning chemical. Make sure your pre-mixer is properly calibrated for the chemical. If you apply too little of the chemical to the floor, it will not work. Now, a premixer is a device supplied or purchased from your janitorial supply company that mixes the proper amount of cleaning chemical to tap water. Now, remember that this enzyme-based chemical should not be used on floors near tables, equipment, and cooking appliances that must be sanitized with spray chemicals. We don't want to kill the sanitizer. We don't want the sanitizer chemical to kill our enzymes in our floor cleaner. All right, well, now we're going to talk about the other type, cleaner degreaser formula floor cleaning chemicals. Degreaser floor cleaning chemicals are effectively used to remove grease from commercial kitchen floors. When you have a slightly dirty floor, all purpose cleaners are the best suited for this type of cleaning. When degreasers can effectively clean non-greasy surfaces, their use would be excessive for this type of cleaning. There's a combination option of these two, and that's called a cleaner degreaser. Cleaner degreaser floor cleaning chemicals are products that have mixed all purpose cleaner with degreaser. They reside in the in-between land. More effective on greasy floors than all-purpose cleaner, but not as effective as a degreaser on greasy floors. Common improper uses of cleaner degreaser floor cleaning chemicals. Again, there are several common ways that cleaner degreaser chemicals are improperly used and therefore ineffective. The premixer is not calibrated for the chemical used. This means that too little or too much of the floor cleaner goes into the mop bucket. When premixers are not used, it is not uncommon for the staff to pour too much of the floor cleaner into the mop bucket. Using too much floor cleaner mixed with water in the mop bucket 
leaves a soap film on the floor. Ah, here's another one. The use of dish soap leaves a soap film on the floor. Dish soap is to wash dishes, not to clean floors. The use of hand soap leaves a soap film on the floor. I have gone in to our insureds, and because of language barriers, the staff is using hand soap in the mop bucket instead of the cleaning chemical. And they're using the hand soap because it looks good and it smells good, it works on their hands, therefore it should be good on cleaning floors. When water is spilled on a floor that has a soap film on it, the film, because it becomes extremely slippery, these conditions easily lead to slips and falls, exposing your business to claims. I've got a wedding ring on my finger. I want to get it off. I use soapy water to make it slippery. I got a soap film on the floor. Water goes on it. That soap film becomes slippery. That's what causes a slip and fall. People have a tendency to want to use the cheapest chemicals they can find just to, to save a little money. And that makes total sense. You got to save money anywhere you can. Uh, but they don't factor in the cost of a slip and fall into that. So you save $100 on some of your cleaning chemicals, but you have a slip and fall. It raises your insurance rates. It causes you to lose an employee for a week. You have to find a replacement. If somebody slips and falls and it hurts your business's reputation through the media or whatever, all of that adds up to a whole lot more than that, that cheap chemical that you bought to clean the floor with in the first place. Thank you, Shelby. Okay, now we're going to talk about the proper use of cleaner, degreaser, floor cleaning chemicals. So how should you be using your cleaner, degreaser chemicals? Okay, first, make sure the chemicals pre-mixer is calibrated. In other words, it has to be calibrated for the chemical. If you change chemicals, you've got to calibrate your pre-mixer for the chemical or get a different pre-mixer supplied by the janitorial company for that chemical. If you're not using a pre-mixer, use the proper amount of the chemical per the label, per the label on the bottle or the container in the mop bucket. Not too little, not too much. Now, some of our insureds like to use Tide, okay? It cleans clothes, and you can buy Tide packages from mop buckets. Now, when you use Tide, it's going to leave a soapy film on the floor, which could result in a slip and fall if the floor gets wet. Now, always use a clean mop and mop bucket. Mix the chemical with water at the recommended temperature. For greasy kitchen floors, consider first mopping the floor with a degreaser then, after the degreaser mopping is completed, mop the floor a second time with a floor cleaning chemical. If using a properly diluted degreaser, make sure and give the degreaser a few minutes to work. The degreaser needs time to dissolve the grease and oils to be effective. However, be careful, the floor will be slippery at this point. Okay, tips for using floor cleaning chemicals. The most important consideration is to have a systematic procedure for cleaning your floors. This saves time and ensures all areas are properly cleaned. Again, make sure your pre-mixers are specifically calibrated to the chemical being used. Consult product instructions and pre-mixer manual. Train your staff not to mix too much or too little of the floor cleaning chemical in the mop bucket. If you're using a degreaser, remember to allow time for the degreaser to work on the floor. It should be on the floor for no less than five minutes before removal by mopping. Remember to scrub the floor with a stiff bristle brush while the chemical is on the floor. All right, time for another poll question. Why am I the meanie? I'm the only one always asking questions, making them do homework. This is a real easy one. This is a real basic question. Do you have a deck brush? Do you even know what a deck brush is? 
I hope so, but we'll see if, if you do. This is a yes or no. And also, also take a second to remind you, if you do have any questions from any of the content, uh, we get to talk about enzymes and all that. If you come across any questions, just type them into the questions section in the chat and send them our way and we'll answer them at the end. So it looks like we've got about half the people voted. We've got a few more coming in. And right now it's at 40% yes, 60% no. Oh, I hope that goes higher because deck brushes are important. Okay. Looks like we've about got everybody in. And it looks like it's about a 50-50 split on yes and no. So, so good to know. Um, what we're going to do now is just go through very basic floor cleaning, cleaning procedures. Um, these are really basic, good for any type of general flooring. Uh, there's a lot of different kinds of really specific types of flooring out there. Uh, this is not for that. This is just general basic floor cleaning. Uh, so we always recommend, you know, since there's so many different types of flooring out there, different flooring materials, uh, that we that you check with the manufacturer of the material that you're using, uh, because your material manufacturer for your specific flooring will have very specific rules of what they what they've tested and what they know will work very well for your flooring type. So we always check suggest that you check with them. Um, to get the very specific flooring types. But for very basic, it means very basic. So we're gonna start with just sweeping the floor. Um, just, just a basic floor sweeping uh, is, is really important just to get the dirt and the grime off there. I, you wouldn't believe how many pancake houses I've gone into at two in the afternoon after the, the lunch rush, and they're putting down mop water on 30 pancakes on the floor. That's just making more mess. That's making more grease and grime. Take the time to sweep the dry floor and get all of that stuff up off there. Okay, we've already discussed the chemicals that will be used whenever you start the mopping process. Um, so you already know that. Uh, but be sure to read carefully. You know, some of the solutions are made to use with warm water and cold water. We, we've we emphasized that several times because that's really important that it's really, it's really chemical specific. Uh, and, and we've gotten so accustomed just to warm water with every chemical that some of them just really do require that cold water for them to be effective. Uh, this, is, this would be a good time to make sure you've really restricted access to the area. When you're mopping a floor, the right signage means everything. Floor signs, barricades, whatever you need to make sure that nobody can access the area. Let everybody around know that you're going to be mopping. Uh, let your coworkers know that you're going to be mopping the floor. That way they don't come speeding through there and have an employee hurt. You don't want your coworkers on the floor. Uh, but once you've got it barricaded off, once you've got the signs up, you know everybody's been notified, then it's time to start the mopping. So you'll apply the solution, whatever solution that is that you've put together with your mopping bucket. Uh, you want to be sure you have a separate mopping bucket ready for the front of house and the back of house. And now that's common terminology for restaurants and most people on here probably are in the restaurant or bar business, but may have some that don't understand. Front of house, just dining room area, back of house, kitchen area. So you don't want the back of house mop that you're going to clean the kitchen area that would have grease. You don't want to pull that out into the front of house. Uh, you want to make sure that they're they're very separate, that they, they have different, different mops that are going to be used for different times. Uh, now's the time when we're going to talk about the deck brush. The deck brush is just, it's a stiff bristled brush. It kind of looks like a small broom and it, it has a really, it, it's good for agitating the material. You're going to use it to scrub. It's kind of like a scrub brush on a long handle. So this is one of the things that people really overlook. Uh, the material, the flooring materials, the grout lines, everything, they have tiny little pores in them. And those pores, the, the grease likes to hide down in those pores. And if you just pour something on it and mop over it, that all that grease stays in those pores. So the deck brush is where you can really scrub in there and get all of that stuff that's hiding inside those pores. So you also don't want the deck brush, you don't want that to be a loving massage for the floor. Uh, it's, you really want that to be a firm agitation. Uh, that, that could be a time that you want to really get in there and get in the seams and the edges and the grout lines and scrub those floors really good with that. It's a good chance to get a ex little exercise and release some stress while you're on the job. So as, as Frank said a little bit ago, don't get in a hurry. You know, people tend to get in a real big hurry when they're mopping the floors. And when you're using these degreasers and these chemicals, 
they need to sit for a bit. They need to they need to chill out and relax and do their thing uh, while they're eating up and emulsifying all of that grease and that dirt because uh, you don't want all that left behind. You're putting it on there for a reason. Let it do its job. Let it sit there for a little bit and then get rid of it. So it's got to stay wet for a little while. Um, you really want to make sure that this, this is a really important time to make sure you have good signage, good barricades, because that wet floor is sitting there and you're not actively scrubbing on it. So when somebody walks by, they don't see you scrubbing the floor and may not instantly go, oh, that's wet. But so if you have good barricades, good signage up, they can see. Uh, I would definitely stand by. Don't leave it. Don't leave it unattended. Stand by um, so you can always see if anybody walks around so you can alert them too. I, I wanted to really emphasize the importance of having separate mops. Um, this is really important. Some people don't think it's that important. I, I have a, a, a personal story that to relate to it. Um, I have a, a brother. I will say he's a half brother, and this lapse in judgment came from the nod blood half. So uh, he worked at a sandwich shop a number of years back, and he spilled a bunch of oil on the floor behind the prep line. And he went through and he cleaned it up mopped it up, did a good job, and then after that, he proceeded to mop the whole dining room floor with the same mop. Closed the store up, everything was wonderful. He did such a good job that day. Then the next morning, he got a call from the manager asking him about his closing procedures because they had had three slip and falls in the dining room that morning, and he had brought every bit of that oil out from behind the prep line with that mop out into the dining room and just put a basically put an oil slick on their entire dining room floor. So I think he learned his lesson. Um, but it happens a lot more than you would think. So you really have to take the time to designate. It's, it's always best to have two separate mop and bucket sets, one for front of house, one for back of house, and they're never, never taken into the other area. If you can put them in a front of house mop closet and a back of house mop closet, that way nobody ever mistakes them or takes them to the front or back when they shouldn't, that's really good. You can also color code them. You can use uh, like colored masking tape or, or colored duct tape uh, to put on the handle of the broom and around the mop bucket. You can even take a Sharpie and just write on them, front of house, back of house. Uh, that way they can just look at it and read it. But once you do that, you also have to take a, take a minute during pre-shift meetings or quarterly staff meetings, whenever you get a chance and remind them why you do that. You know, Remind them, hey, green mop is for front of house, blue mop is for back of house, don't ever mix them up. And this is why, you know, we don't want slip and falls. We have to prevent it and keeping them separate keeps the grease separated. So just some management reminders and, and reinforcement from the management level is always good. All right, now we're gonna discuss commercial floor scrubber machines. Automatic floor scrubbers, also known as auto scrubbers, are a type of floor cleaning machine that are used to scrub a floor clean of light debris dust, oil, grease, or floor marks. Auto scrubbers can be categorized into one of three main types, walk behind, stand on, and rider. Each of these is equipped with a separate dispensing solution tank and collection recovery tank to keep the clean water separate from the dirty water. So in one pass over the floor, a user can dispense cleaner, scrub it into the floor, then vacuum it up with an auto scrubber squeegee attached at the back of the machine. Advantages of using floor scrubbers. As you can imagine, there are several advantages to using a floor scrubber. Among other things, a floor scrubber enables quicker drying time. When you use a traditional mop, and bucket to clean a floor, drying time may take some time. Given that a floor scrubber doesn't use nearly as much water as a traditional mop, wet floor times should be shorter. This will help decrease the likelihood of, of customers slipping and falling, which could possibly lead to a lawsuit. A floor scrubber not only uses less water, therefore allowing the floor to dry more quickly, it also leads to a more efficient clean than a traditional mop and bucket can offer. This cleaning equipment has the power to remove grime, grease, and dirt that are traditionally very difficult to remove. In particular, a floor scrubber 
does its magic by spraying water and chemical on the floor, scrubbing the dirt and grime away, and leaving a perfect shine in its wake. You will find a floor scrubber rather easy to operate as you only have to select the settings you want. You can either push it from behind or ride it across the area to be clean, depending on whether you have a push floor scrubber or a ride on one. Either variety reduces the amount of effort that the operator has to exert and enables a larger surface to be cleaned in a smaller amount of time. A floor scrubber could be the perfect solution for your business if you experience a lot of traffic and find your staff needing to clean the floors continuously. Okay, we're going to talk about floor scrubber cleaning chemicals. Cleaning chemicals for floor scrubbing machines must be low foaming and non-corrosive for the various mechanics and inner workings of the machine. Highly corrosive chemicals such as bleach can both be damaging to the plastic tanks as well as dry out gaskets and seals. For instance, if you were using a foam that foams as much as dish soap does, this surely would cause excessive foam when entering the recovery tank of your machine, raising the chances of it entering into your vacuum motor and potentially causing a lot of damage. Only use a floor cleaning chemical recommended by the manufacturer or designated for your machine. This eliminates the risk of damage to your machine and ensures the best cleaning results. You don't want a soap film. You won't have a soap film on the floor that would cause a slip and fall if water gets on the floor if you use the proper chemical designed for your machine. Okay. After each use of your floor scrubbing machine, after each use, the dispenser solution and especially the collection recovery tanks should be emptied and rinsed out to prevent dirt buildup. The brushes, vacuum hose, and squeegee should also be rinsed to prevent dirt buildup. The filters need to be cleaned. That means hosing them out with water. The vac motor should be run for several minutes afterwards to remove any moisture that could be present in the vac motor to reduce chances of corrosion that could result in vac motor damage. Remember, follow the manufacturer's maintenance instructions for your machine. All right, scheduled preventive maintenance of floor scrubbing machines. A general rule of thumb is to do preventative maintenance for every 100 hours or 90 days. Have this work completed by a service contractor recommended by the machine's manufacturer. These are usually warranty service contractors. Have the service contractor perform the basic inspections to keep the machine in good running order. This includes checking, repairing or replacing hoses, filters, linkages, grease fittings, drive motors, brush motors, vacuum motors, actuator motors, LCD displays, switches, squeegees, and batteries are just some of the items that need routine inspection. Anything that moves or comes in contact with water or a cleaning chemical needs to be cleaned. Now, I'm going to explain some problems that I see in the field with these machines. Okay, problem number one, the cleaning chemicals that are sold by the manufacturers are expensive. Five gallon pail, I've seen as much as costing $150. What happens is, rather than look for an alternative chemical that is recommended for your machine, maybe made by a different company. Owners and employees use cleaning chemicals used for the floor, not designed for the machine. And they use something else. They use bleach and water. 
Bleach is cheap. Bleach can be used as a sanitizer. So think, I'm in the grocery store business. I'm cleaning the front of my house. I want to make sure the floors are clean and sanitized. I'm tired of paying $150 a bucket for a five-gallon bucket. I've got bleach on the shelf of my store. I get my staff. We mix the bleach and water. Hey, the floor has been sanitized. Looks clean. What I'm doing is I'm destroying my machine. So this is it's not uncommon for me to come into places where this has been the practice and find the machine out of service or constantly requiring costly repairs. You don't want to do that. The cleaning chemical that you use on your floors with a mop and bucket can leave a soapy film on your floor because it's not designed for this type of machine. So this can cause slips and falls. One of the things that we do at Society Insurance is we test floors for slippage and falls. I go into a store where they've been using the wrong chemicals in the front of the house on the floor scrubber and I test the floors and I find out, boy, these floors are highly likely uh, for a slip and fall to develop if water gets on them. So the staff, by using the wrong chemicals, has defeated the use of the machine. They've created a hazard that creates slips and falls, and they're also, in reality, destroying the machine. So these machines are great, but they're, they're really made to cover a lot of areas. So if you've got a, a large flooring surface, a big box store, for example, uh, they really clean up the floors great. They, they don't leave any water behind. That way you don't have to keep them while they're, you don't have to monitor it while it dries because it's already dry. But the flip side of that is they do cost a little bit. You got to use the right chemical. You got to maintain them properly. So there's definitely some advantages to using them. And there's also the time and place, just a mop and buckets where you need to go. All right. Thank you, Shelby. Now I want to talk about the next steps. Now it's time to put what we have used during this webinar today into use. All right, make sure that you're using signage and barriers properly to alert workers and customers of possible wet floors and blockages necessary. Take time to write down your floor cleaning procedures and train your staff so everyone is aware of the dangers and steps to prevent slips and falls. And stick with it. Monitor your staff and continue to offer training and education when needed. Awesome. So let's take a take a second to kind of recap. Uh, when we clean floors, floors, we want to avoid things that'll make them slippery. So we're looking at the improper use of floor cleaning chemic yeah, floor cleaning chemicals that makes your floor slippery. Uh, we don't want you to use the wrong cleaning chemicals in your floor scrubber uh, because it'll damage it. We don't want you to use the wrong chemicals on your wrong type of floor because it won't clean it properly. Uh, we also don't want you to use warm water when you're using enzymes because that will destroy its ability to work properly. So there's a lot of a lot of specifics. You know, really everything you use is going to come with manufacturer recommendations. And they give you those recommendations because they've been tested over and over again. They know they're going to make them work properly. So everything's not designed the same. Read the manufacturer's labels. If you if you use a chemical supply company that brings them to you, ask them to explain it. Don't just let them drop it off and, and tell you thanks and send you an invoice. Tell them to explain how best do I use these chemicals and what would be a pitfall with using the chemicals improperly. So also improper floor cleaning procedures. If you're not doing it right, it's just not going to work right. So, you know, again, that goes back to your, your wet versus cold, your separate mop buckets for front of house, back of house, things like that that make sure that your cleaning regimen is effective and also standardized so that one employee is not doing it different from the next. One employee might do it the right way and create a hazard for the next one that comes along and does it a different way. So just also standardizing it. Uh, slip and falls really affect the bottom line of your business. I, that's what we all, that's what we own businesses for. That's what we go to work for each day is to make sure we have money to pay our bills. And when that bottom line is impacted, everyone from the owner down is impacted. Yeah. So anytime you can help limit slip and falls, uh, it'll, it'll help with your premiums. Uh, it'll help with your, obviously your employees not getting hurt, customers not getting hurt, protect your reputation. Uh, there, there's really nothing, there's no negatives to make creating a, a safe environment. Uh, do you have anything else to add to that, Frank? You know, Shelby, you covered a lot of the highlights. I'm going to just drive some things that you've talked about. If you want to kill your enzymes, 
and you're using one of those like uh, Ecolab's wash and walk chemicals, have your staff use hot water. Remember, we have language barriers going on. Uh, we have issues where staff can't re read labels in English or even in, sometimes in their native language. Common sense says if we're using hot water is good to clean. So if people don't know better, they're going to mix it with hot water. So we've killed the enzyme base uh, product immediately in the mop bucket even before we put it, put it on the floors. And then to add insult to injury, if we're using a mop that was used uh, in another area with another chemical, maybe in the front of the house, or with a degreaser, that adds, if, if the hot water didn't kill it, which I'll trust, trust me, it did, the degreaser or the cleaning chemical will. Then, remember, we got to sanitize things. We, we don't want, uh, uh, you know, to be in the newspaper, finding out that we've got all our customers sick and having our business shut down because of we haven't sanitized properly in the back of the house. And these sanitizing chemicals kill kill the enzymes. I don't recommend enzyme-based floor cleaning chemicals anymore for the back of the house, uh, like a restaurant or in areas of a grocery store where we're preparing food or cooking food. Also, we got to watch out and find out what our staff's doing. If they're overmixing, we're going to have that soap film. That soap film is going to cause a slip and fall. And again, as Shelby mentioned, using the wrong chemicals in the floor cleaning machine make it ineffective. So the long and the short is, if we're using the wrong chemicals, we're wasting our money. So we have to focus on that, or if we're mixing them wrong or using the wrong floor cleaning procedures. A lot of this comes back to management controls, management education. Uh, the, the management staff needs to know what chemicals are being used and the proper way to use them, and then pass that information on to the staff and reinforce it through pre-shift meetings, uh, quarterly staff meetings, whenever you get a chance, uh, it can be you know, reinforced over and over again. And you're always, you know, the restaurant industry has always has staff turnover. So there's always new staff to train. Um, and it's always good to keep the others in the know. Uh, I want to draw your attention to uh, about midway down on your control bar. There are a couple of handouts we've attached. Uh, one of them is a, a slip and fall floor cleaning procedures handout. And the other one, we put together some cleaning information on specific types of flooring. We didn't want to go into a lot of different specific types of flooring, but we gave an overview in the handout of some different specific types of flooring. Again, refer you back to your manufacturer's guidelines. They have very specific and very detailed information of how to clean your specific type of floor, but you're welcome to print those off, uh, save them. You can also find them on our risk control website, uh, societyinsurance.com. Uh, there's a risk management tab. Uh, there's education and training. Our risk control team really works hard to, to do everything we can to provide resources to anyone out there that needs to use them. They're always on our website, uh, free to use. Uh, we have a, a lending library, our, our risk control library of handouts of every different safety topic imaginable. Um, for the, our customers, we also have a, a streaming video uh, system. We Just anything we can provide, we try to. So take a look at societyinsurance.com under risk management and see if there's anything there that'll help you out. We told you guys we'd have a few minutes here at the end for some questions and answers. And it looks like we've had a few questions come in. So we will take a second and answer a few questions. Anybody else, there's still plenty of time. So anybody else that has any other questions, feel free to type them in, send them, and we'll get to them. Um, let's see. Got one that says, how do I know what type of cleaning chemical to start with? All right. Shelby, I'm going to jump in on this one. My first recommendation is deal with a reputable janitorial company and have one of their experts come out and look at your floors, the type of floor surface that what we've got, what type of flooring that you're, you're, you're using. And uh, they will recommend a product and I would use it. Now, remember, many of them are still recommending the enzyme-based chemicals in kitchen areas areas where you have equipment that needs to be sanitized, um, I don't recommend uh, these products in these areas. So that's my two cents. So you can say, well, we recommend they may come by and, and everybody's using the enzyme-based uh, chemicals in the kitchen. You may say, well, I have concerns about 
uh, sanitizers killing them. I have concerns about my staff mixing them with hot water. What type of product would you recommend instead of an enzyme-based chemical? And that's what I would go with. Okay. Susan is asking, uh, she says, I have some existing buildup on our floors in the back of house already. Uh, how can I fix this and start fresh with better procedures? That's a good question. Man. It's an excellent question, Shelby. Many times uh, what has happened is because of floor cleaning, poor floor cleaning procedures or using the wrong chemicals or using them improperly, we've got a big buildup. Okay, we've got a problem. And what I recommend is hiring a contractor to come in and steam clean the floors, which will get them pretty close to how they were when they were originally installed and then go forward with proper floor cleaning procedures and use the proper floor cleaning chemicals. I've, I've seen a lot of these folks that buy a restaurant and when they come in to take over, the floors are already a disaster. And so that may be what she's dealing with is coming in and saying, oh my gosh, I've got to get this place ready to run properly and it's already a mess. So she's got to start from the beginning. Okay, uh, looks like what, what's the difference between enzyme-based cleaner and a degreaser as far as performance so don't don't they both eliminate grease which should i use okay you're correct they both eliminate uh, eliminate grease they're both good products i would recommend uh an enzyme based cleaner if they're used in an area okay that that you're not going to be sanitizing with spray on sanitizers and also you literally i'm, I'm gonna you're gonna chuckle about this but you take the hot water uh, knob off your slop sink, okay? So you can't add hot water into the bucket. If you if you've got two, if you if you can do that, all right, to make sure that your staff doesn't kill the product with hot water, and you're not using spray on sanitizers, well then you can can I would consider using an enzyme based product. But if you're worried about the hot water issue or you're using the sanitizers, definitely use a degreaser or a degreaser cleaning chemical. Taking the knob off sounds like a silly solution, but sometimes the most basic things work the best. It's like putting colored tape on the handle of a mop to tell you where it's supposed to be used and stored. It's really basic and really visual, but it, it works. Got one more that's come in if nobody else pops up any questions. Looks like the last one is uh, asking about the auto scrubber. Uh, any suggestions for choosing one? Is there a difference between the effectiveness of the walk behind or the stand on type or the rider type? Okay, Shelby, that's an excellent question. There's no difference in cleaning results if you're maintaining them and using the proper chemical for them. It's really a, a, a choice. Uh, and it's also how much you want to spend uh, uh, for them. And a lot of it is how, how big is the area that you're cleaning. If you've got a, a grocery store and you may want to consider it's, it's a, you've got a, a large area out in front, you may want to consider a, a rider. But I've also seen, you know, also people using the, the, the walk behind or stand on. It's really, it's what you want, how much you want to pay in, in, in your, your personal preferences. All right, that's all the questions that have come in. If there's any more? If there's not any more questions, I really do. I thank you for joining us today. I really hope it's it's been helpful information. Um, I hope it'll be some things you can take back to your business and help prevent some slips and falls. Uh, it really does make an impact on the bottom line. It really does make an impact on everything. Uh, we'll be sending out a, a follow-up survey uh, by email that you registered with shortly. We do appreciate your feedback. We want to make these as, as good as we can and look for you know future opportunities to do more of them. We'll be hosting another free webinar in December on preventing muscle strain injuries in the workplace. Hope everybody can join us for that. Tell your coworkers or friends, join us. Uh, we'll also do more webinars that will be added in the calendar for 2019. So watch your email, check our website, it's societyinsurance.com, and social media for announcements. Always check the YouTube channel if you, if you like the webinar and want somebody else to take a look at it, want to show your staff at a staff meeting, feel free. Um, and you can also always visit societyinsurance.com. I hope you guys have a really good rest of the day and a good weekend. Thank you.